I want to thank Paul Reeves, who is director of the OSU Urban Forestry Graduate Certificate Program for offering comments on my talk. So by the end of the hour, I hope you will know the characteristics of a strong structure, learn how to shape and prune a variety of trees, and understand how to use heading removal and reduction cuts. As is with every 10 minute university presentation before we give it, we review comprehensively resources available, including published books and university materials. And for this talk, I did the same. And the resource that I found to be most useful is shown on the screen. University of Florida's Dr. Ed Gilman Arboriculture video series. If you don't know, Dr. Gilman is an internationally renowned tree expert. I offer the link on the page in case you're interested in exploring further. The series has 51 lectures plus 73 additional videos, and I watched them all, and I have to say it was a treat. So let's begin with the concept of apical dominance. This is the principle behind how plants respond to pruning. It begins with oxen, which is a is present in very high concentrations near the tip of a bud. Oxen's job is to prevent buds below from developing. Oxen moves uh, by gravity. So in a vertical branch, the effect of oxen is the strongest. In the angle, the effect is moderate. And in a horizontal branch, the effect is almost non-existent. So given the role of oxen, what happens when we prune? In making a heading cut, we remove a portion of a branch, but keeping some portion. What we did by removing the portion is removing oxen at the tip of these branches, therefore leaving the rest of the branch to grow and all the latent buds are free to develop. The result is a bushier plant. When we make a thinning cut, we cut at the point of origin of a branch. If we had made a clean cut, there is nothing left for new shoots to develop. So even though the oxen was removed with a cut, we end up with a plant that's more open Thinning cut is also called removal cut, as it's shown here. There is a third cut, which I'm going to focus today in this presentation, and it's called reduction cut. On the surface, it seems to be somewhat like removal cut, but they're quite different. The removal cut in our example does involve two branches, but in general, the one that's taken out is smaller. In the reduction cut, let's look at this, this example closer. We have two branches come together here, and we want to remove the portion that's upright and stronger by making a cut right here. And we can repeat that cut further up the branch here. With these two reduction cuts, we're taking out the larger of the two, leaving the smaller one. And reduction cuts are most successful if the remaining branch is roughly one half to one third the diameter of the one that's removed. The purpose of a reduction cut is to slow the growth of the remaining branch. So let's review the three cuts. Heading cuts keep a portion of a branch and make it bushier. Thinning or removal cuts take out the entire branch and make the plant look more open. Reduction cuts keep a portion of a branch and make it less vigorous. In how to cut a small branch, we used to advise using the illustration in the left, making a cut at a 45 degree angle. Well, that is no longer the case. So forget about it and look at the right half illustrations. Today, we recommend making the cut that is perpendicular to the branch. So kind of a straight cross. And the reason is because when you do a perpendicular cut, you create a smaller wound than an angle cut, which proved to be a very important difference. We still advise cutting to an outward bud, 
and roughly a quarter inch above the bud. And if you're interested in reading more explanation about the angle versus the straight cut, I provide a reference on the screen. Okay, if we're cutting a large branch, the steps are still number one, make an undercut roughly six to 12 inches away from the joint. Number two, cut through the rest of the branch to remove the weight. And number three, remove the stub. I want to say a little bit more about the location of the third cut, label C. And that is, we need to make the cut by preserving the branch collar. So let's begin with this left half of the photo, which shows branch bark ridge. That's the result of the trunk bark pushing against the branch bark as they grow together. That is quite easy to find in trees. Beginning from the branch bark ridge and moving toward the stem, in this photo we can see a slightly swollen area and that's labeled collar. Collar is a very important part of um, a, a tree because that's where a lot of the energy reserve and the chemicals that will slow down the spread of decay uh, exist. So when we make a cut, we want to follow the line marked in the right photo that says yes, which is right outside the collar and keeping the collar intact and not cutting into the collar. This means it's important to know how to identify collar in the tree. Unfortunately, different trees have a different shape um, and look of collar. Some may appear swollen like we've seen, some may appear wrinkled like the middle photo, and in some it may be very difficult to locate. So the way to do it, if you cannot visually identify the collar, is to begin with the branch bark ridge and then draw an imaginary line that is flush with the trunk and estimate the angle between these two and simply repeat the angle on the other side and that gives you where to make the cut. And again, cut at an angle which will give you a wound that is round, not an oval. So the good news is trees can seal a correct cut. I offer some photo examples here so you can see what they look like. The bad news is sealing is different from healing. Just because a tree can seal a wound does not mean there is no internal injury. In fact, all cuts lead to decay. The question is how much? Uh, but in general, research has shown that the larger the cut, the larger the area of decay. And the tree's ability to ward off decay within varies by species. We talked about the importance of collar and um, research has shown that when we make a cut, if the collar is intact, it's always better in terms of the amount of decay than no collar. And I had mentioned that the size of the cut is an indication of the area of internal decay. And in fact, I think most of us have seen that mature trees um, coexisting or tolerating a certain amount of dead wood. When you see uh, fungus growing on a tree, that's usually indication of decomposition of dead wood. But of course, we don't want to promote dead wood as a result of our pruning. So I would say rule number one about timing in pruning is begin sooner rather than later. These photos show, and it's, it's been proven by research, that trees do not grow out of their structural defect. So as they grow older, all the problems that exist, existed when they were young continue. And we know for a fact that correcting a young tree is much less damaging than fixing an old tree. So rule number one, therefore, is begin when your tree is young. There are a few other things we probably should talk about um, regarding timing. When we prune in the winter, it's easier to see the plant structure, but the wounds will take longer to dry. And if we are um, too enthusiastic with making cuts, those cuts can potentially encourage very rigorous response when growth begins in the spring. Um, often we get water shoots, those water spouts, those uh, vertical upright, uh, pretty scary looking shoots. I think when it comes to climate considerations, 
in the past, we would say prune when the plant is dormant. Today, I'm not so sure, especially when it comes to plants that uh, may be more fragile. Uh, so for example, if I prune something, then uh, in, the, in the winter when it's dormant, and then we have a early, a false start of an early spring, the tree starts growing, and then we get a um, cold snap that comes and damage the new growth. So if I have anything that's fragile that I really want to take great care, I think I would keep the pruning job until slightly later when the weather events are less likely to be an issue. Now, summer pruning is known to be a way to slow growth because we're reducing foliage, which is used for photosynthesis. And if that is your goal, you want to prune around summer solstice. But keep in mind, when there is too much reduction, we may weaken the plant. And in my mind, the effect on soil microbes when the tree is on the diet is an issue that should be explored further. Now, I think most of us know that uh, plants share carbohydrates with soil microbes through their root exudates. And the microbes are important for soil structure, and they also help to procure water and nutrients for tree roots. So if we put the tree on a diet, one can reason that there is less available to support the soil microbe community. Summer, however, is a good time to prune varieties where wounds are likely to get infected. And in terms of the climate considerations, I think the prolonged heat and drought probably should caution all of us to be, um, to be on the lighter side in summer pruning. So we're not inviting uh, sun scald and, uh, and we're not creating further stress on the trees uh, when they are already uh, under stress from heat and drought. And it's obvious that uh, flowering trees, if they bloom in the spring, they should be pruned after flowering um, in the early summer. And if they're summer bloomers, they should be pruned in late winter, just as growth is beginning. And I think the same climate considerations may apply here if you have something that you really do not want a cold snap to damage uh, the new flower buds uh, or the new shoots, then you might want to prune slightly later. So the general timing um, guidelines, any time is good for removing dead, diseased, and damaged portions of a tree. But when a tree is under stress, for example, when uh, it's really cold or hot out there, or when it's um, being planted or transplanted, or during the post-dormancy, meaning a tree is just beginning to come out of being dormant and beginning to grow, so usually early spring, and then in late summer, early fall, when a tree is getting ready to go into dormancy, those are the more vulnerable periods for the tree and take care in not pruning, or at least not making major pruning. So in general, there are three major reasons for pruning, beauty, health, production. Next week, when we talk about fruit trees, the emphasis will be on production. And today's talk will focus on health. And the beauty is a tricky one because it's in the eyes of the beholder. So I would say if you, if beauty is your primary objective in pruning trees, and you're interested in uh, what I consider unnatural shapes of trees, um, check out the book by Jake Hobson. It's called The Art of Creative Pruning. And it has lots of examples of um, different styles of pruning trees in different parts of the world. I mean, there are cultural differences and geographic differences, and it's quite eye-opening and a fun read. But for me, I like to prune to accentuate the natural form. And all of us know that trees have many different forms and shapes. I think the one thing we need to, to keep in mind is since in a garden scale, often we're beginning with a young tree, the, the form and the shape of a young tree of the same species is can be quite different from when it becomes mature. In general, the young tree tends to be more upright and narrower, and uh, the mature shape tends to be wider in the middle and the top. So keep that in mind um, when you approach pruning. Now let's go on and talk about pruning for good structure so we can create a tree that is strong to withstand future hazards weight, 
from uh, snow and ice and uh, stress from wind. And um, don't worry too much about the stick drawings of trees here, because I will break down the details in the slides that are coming up. But the important message is developing a strong framework by using structural pruning should be the priority in pruning trees. And structural pruning focuses on pruning the parts of the crown that will contribute to weakness. Structural pruning is um, only effective if it's kept up. So it's not a one-time proposition, but rather it can take years. So be before we talk about how to prune for structure, we should consider the criteria against which we um, define or a good strong structure. So our first criteria is branch placement. The ideal pattern, when you look from the side, branches should be spaced anywhere from eight to 24 inches apart. And that's measured by the point of attachment to the main trunk. If we look from the top down, the branches should be distributed like spokes of a wheel radiating from the center. The second criteria in uh, a, strong a strong structure is aspect ratio. And aspect ratio is defined by the diameter of the branch divided by the diameter of the trunk. So if we look at the example in the middle, A is roughly half of B, and we get an aspect ratio of one half. And in the second example, the smaller trunk is uh, roughly two thirds, I would think, of the other branch. So the aspect ratio is about two thirds. Now, keep in mind, two thirds and one half both are smaller than one, and that's considered small ratio, which gives us a stronger branch connection. The example in the lower left, where the two branches are about the same size, so the ratio becomes one, and one is a larger ratio, and it gives us a weaker connection. If this is not making too much sense, look at the photo example on the right, where a small diameter branch is connected to a much larger trunk, where you can see the trunk wood wraps around the small branch to form a very strong, solid attachment. Branch angle where the branches come together and the angle of their connection is another important factor. The example on the left shows about a 45 degree angle and that gives us a strong connection, 45 degrees or wider. When we have a narrow angle like the uh, example on the right, it's a weaker connection. And another problem in a narrow angle is the bark of these two adjoining branches often get pressed in the middle where the connection of wood is supposed to be. And the spark prevents the wood connection to form in a way that's strong. And here's an example to show you. Included branch, these two have very narrow angle between them. So the bark is included here. And after a storm, one portion is broken and we can see in the branch connection, instead of wood on wood, we have a large portion of it that is bark on bark, giving us a very weak connection and a broken branch. Okay, so we've talked about branch placement, branch aspect ratio and branch angle. Let's look at these examples and see if we can apply those. So let's begin with A. Placement, all right. There are some vertical gaps between the points of attachment to the trunk. There seem to be a 360 coverage around the trunk. Aspect ratio, the side branches seem to be much smaller than the trunk in the area facing us. However, and the angles are pretty good, but I see a problem here. Follow the pointer. Can you see the V here? 
This is the result of two branches of roughly the same size attached to each other, forming a very narrow angle. I know there is included bark here. So that is a problem area that needs to be fixed. Let's look at example B. Placement, no vertical gap whatsoever. All the stems, branches come out around the same area in the trunk. So that is a major problem. And as, as a result, we can see the aspect ratio is bad because all these branches are about the same size. And you can see included bark right here. And um, let's look at C. Okay, this is probably the best one. Placement, little crowded. Uh, vertical distance is probably on the small side. So we may want to remove with thinning cuts some of the branches. But in general, the angles are good. Aspect ratio is good. The branches are much smaller than the trunk. Um, so C is best. But regardless of the problem and the severity of the problem, structural pruning is a way to improve the structure. And let's take a look at how that's done. So the goals and steps in structural pruning is to cultivate a strong central leader. And to achieve that, we want to prevent upright stems from competing with the leader. And when we are able to, to take step two in preventing the upright stem from being a competitor, we do that by slowing down the growth of the side branch. Okay, so let's look at these tree as the example for how to do structural pruning and follow these three points here. Number one, where is the leader? Look at the before pruning tree, the uh, uh, stick drawing. Where is the leader? Okay, I would say this is the leader and they've already labeled it C for us. Number two, where is the competition? Well, I can see two obvious competition. Now remember, the competitions are the ones that are interfering with the leader and they tend to be upright. So here and here. And they already labeled A and B for us. So the third part is up to us. Where do we cut the competition? We don't want to allow the competition to stay as, as they are, because if we do, we're going to end up with number one, the upright branch will form a very narrow crotch angle, remember? So that's a weak joint. And in addition, that um, competition will grow very vigorously and potentially compete and suppress the growth of the central leader. So that keeps the central trunk from gaining in size and the side shoot will, in comparison, grow much faster. And that's going to contribute to poor aspect ratio and the branch angle. So where will we cut? Let's look at uh, B first. B is a very vigorous upright shoot. And when you look at the branches, there's quite a bit near the top here that overlaps other branches on the tree, which already have better position, better angle. They tend to be more 45 degree or wider. And um, so if I were making the decision, I would remove B right at here where I put this red dot. Because if, we, if I make the cut here, I will suppress the branch to this portion that remain, but it's relatively low, quite a distance away from the central leader. And it, um, I th it, and it also remove the competition and the interference with the rest of the existing branches. Let's look at A. Right here, there is a vertical portion that's competing against the central leader. So we definitely want to take that out. And um, you could say, if you want to prune a little more severely, to make the cut right here where I put the dot. And that will give us a remaining branch pointed uh, maybe 60 degrees outward. So you can see that there are different choices depending on how harshly we want to prune. And in fact, that's what the examples on the rest of the graph show us. Let's take a closer look at how to make a reduction cut. So the left image shows an example of a hypothetical central leader that is being potentially interfered with or overtaken by a couple of side branches that are fairly vigorous. So how do we go about making the cuts? So we'll make a reduction cut here and here. 
And that, those two cuts will suppress the two side branches, reduce their growth, and put them in a subordinated position compared to the central leader. We can stop there and wait a few years and see how the tree respond. And if it's still not doing the job and we're still seeing more competition, we can come back and make more removal. So let's review the reduction cut one more time. Looking at the illustration on the right, we can use two reduction cut to subordinate a limb that is too strong. Now we're subordinating a vigorous growth, a vigorously growing limb. So we're always cutting away the more upright, vigorous portion. So that would be here. And if we continue up, that would be here. And again, our purpose is to slow down the growth of this branch. And the benefit of slowing down the growth is we will end up with a better aspect ratio. The branch will not grow as fast and become smaller relatively to the trunk. And uh, that will give us a stronger attachment. All right, so here's an example of a tree. Take a closer look and tell me what you would do. Now, remember the steps are locate the central leader, identify the competition, and then decide where to cut in order to subordinate the competition. Okay, so I would call this the leader. And I see right in front of me, facing me, is a competition. And this branch is competition because when you see how it grows up, it clearly is in the condition of being parallel to the leader. So it needs to be, um, it needs a, 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 a cut to be subordinated. So the question is, where would we make the cut? Well, looking from down below, this branch is a, it's more than a half, I would say, in diameter of the trunk. So it's a pretty vigorous one. And it's probably a good idea to suppress it uh, more rather than less, given the options. So we can cut it here. And when I say cut, I remo remove that upright branch and leave the one that's pointed toward us. So it's more uh, at a 45 degree angle. Or if that's too harsh for you, you can move up and maybe cut here where there is the next opportunity. But if I were making the cut, I think I would remove it here. And I think that will uh, keep me from having to come back in another year or two or three and make more cuts. So I hope how to use the reduction cut has become a little clearer to you. So when you look at a tree structure, anywhere two branches come together is a potential stress point. And remember, structural pruning is to be done in order to reduce the potential stress and, and strengthen the, the tree structure. So if we begin with the trunk and look up and outward at all the branches, all the branch angle, aspect ratio, and placement three-dimensionally, and look for where the problems are that needs to be applied the reduction cut. I think the answers become pretty clear. So in this example, it's obvious given the central leader, here's one competition, here's another competition, and lower down a third competition by removing the upright shoot that will slow down the growth of the remaining branch and therefore improve the branch angle and aspect, aspect ratio here and likewise, these two other cuts will have a similar effect. So again, we are improving the structure by reducing stress. We want to enable the central leader to stay dominant and that thicken the central leader's trunk. We want to subordinate the side branches. This allow us to reduce the aspect ratio and strengthen the branch attachment. And in addition, we want to look at the weight on these branches, especially the ones that are reaching very far away from the trunk and shorten them. And that allow us to shift the weight toward the trunk. And all these together will allow our tree to better withstand wind, snow, and ice and prevent this kind of breakage from happening. 
There is a fourth element that I did not cover yet, and that's called taper. Taper refers to the fact in a branch or a trunk, it's wider on the bottom and narrower on the top. And research shows the taper, the tree trunk, is better able to, dis, uh, to distribute wind stress and as a result, better able to endure strong wind. So if you live in an area that has strong wind, uh, this is something that you would really care about and, uh, and want to strengthen your tree. Uh, it's an easy answer in helping a tree trunk to gain taper. And that is to keep the lower branches. When I go visit people's gardens, I often see gardeners like to what we call limb up the tree, remove the lower branches so we can grow more other plants around the tree. Well, that turned out to be not a good idea because it is those lower branches that are helping our uh, tree trunk gain taper. Um, in order for a tree to be uh, to, to have great ability to withstand wind, taper is one issue, and the other one is mass for damping. And let me explain that. Okay, so uh, let's begin with the lower left illustration. In it, they show a heavy red weight that is suspended in a blue skyscraper. And this weight act as a counterbalance to improve its stability when the wind is blowing. So this is called mass damping. It turned out there's a similar phenomena in trees. And so we're going to look at those three illustrations from the upper left to the center and to the lower right. The upper left image is uh, tells us that wind moves in the shape of a tube. And so I know that's surprising <laughs> when I learned it. So they used a oval um, to simulate the area of the tree that is affected, that's it directly in the wind. And again, uh, research showed that wind is uh, moves at a higher speed with elevation than at the ground. So finally, when we look at the lower right illustration, our tree has a portion being hit by the wind, but the portion that is not in the wind, that's outside of that tube shape of wind, is acting as the mass damper to help reduce the vibration on our tree in the wind. All right, so that is a lot of uh, mechanical engineering. And what does that mean to pruning? These two are the same species, Acer griseum. The one on the left kept lots of leaves and branches throughout the tree. So it contains more mass for damping compared to the one on the right. So the lesson for pruning is keep lower branches and leaves throughout your tree that will improve the tree's stability in high wind. All right, next, let's move on to roots. I know my, not everybody thinks about uh, roots also need pruning, but they do because after all, when you consider that natural root architecture, there is no nursery container that is a good match for it. So one can expect when we purchase something that's grown in a container from a nursery that the roots will need to be inspected and corrected. And in fact, that's what we should do. So number one, inspect correct the roots. Number two, understand that the ideal roots should be straight and radiate from the trunk. And that means anything that does not fit this, this description should be removed. So anything that's circling, bending, downward, upward, pointing should be taken out. And there are a lot of people doing research on the best way to take a containerized root ball and um, fix it before planting. And the results are mixed. The the alternative is to remove all the container medium or the soil ball, if it's a BMB plant, and um, inspect the roots, as this picture shows, and do the correction. So in, in this example, here's a root that's pointed upwards. Here's a root that's curved. 
And in fact, if you look to the left of the second arrow, there are two or three more roots that are curved. Now these curved roots, if you put them in the ground, they're not gonna straighten themselves. So as they continue to grow and the roots gain in their size, at some point they could uh, girdle the tree. They can choke the tree to death. And if you want to learn more about how to bear root in order to, uh, in order to correct the root problems, I give you uh, a source there, a slide deck from Linda Chalker Scott, Washington State University. All right, and Temin University has uh, a presentation on the subject. And if you are planting something and want to experiment with root washing and correcting, and you're not sure where to make the pruning cuts on the roots, the Garden Professors Facebook group is a group that you have to join in order to post questions, but they have a lot of admins who are well-versed on this topic and can give you individualized um, advice. And in addition, the Garden Professors blog is another good source to read about um, root pruning. Okay, so the, stru the structural pruning um, methods that I've talked about apply to conifers as well. So now we're leaving the broadleaf plants and getting into conifers. Uh, and here are some of the um, okay reasons for a pruning conifer, perhaps with the exception of the slowing the size increase, which one can do, but it's very labor intensive and has to be kept up. Uh, the important thing about pruning conifer is we need to know where new growth will come from before we make the cut. Otherwise, we're likely to end up with a um, a hole or a brown patch. So let's just quickly review the stiff, stiff needle conifers, including spruce fir, Douglas fir, they have buds along the green stem. So if you cut into anywhere that's green, you're safe, but don't cut into old wood because they will not regrow from there. And this group have a tendency of developing more than, uh, but developing a, a side shoot in the leader. So it's helpful to keep it to a single leader form, uh, which is much healthier. Now the flat needle uh, conifers, you will have new growth in the tip and in random growth points along the branches. So it's pretty safe no matter where you cut. The bunch needle um, conifer, for example, pine, they put out a single flush of tip growth every spring that's called a candle, and then they stop growing. So if you want to control size, you simply shorten the candle. And if you don't want the pine to grow more, uh, to gaining size, you can just remove the entire candle. And the final group of conifers have fan-like needles, and that includes arbovita, chemicypress, cypress, juniper. They have new growth in the tips, but also in random growth points along the green wood. So if you cut into green and not old wood, you're safe. I often get people ask about what kind of conifers are suitable for hedges. I like this table from the Chris Brickell and David Joyce book. I think with one caveat, at least in the Pacific Northwest, we know the last two items, Western Red Cedar and Mountain Hemlock, um, have been showing heat stress from the recent past summers. So depending on where you are, you would want to do a check against uh, recent climate trends before using any of these. And if you do get into hedge or topiary, of course, the most important thing to pay attention to is the shape, especially near the bottom. It needs to be exposed to the sun in order to look full and good. And if you have conifer and you want to give pruning a try, I recommend watching this video. Adrian Bloom is um, a very experienced plantsman and his garden, Bressingham Gardens, is absolutely beautiful. So it's a short video with lots of hands-on demonstration in a beautiful setting. Give it a try. All right, so it's time to summarize a lot of the information that we have considered. In strategies for pruning, we should know the natural form of the tree and we need to build strong structure and we want to begin young. And with these three together, I think pruning will become easier. We talked about proper use of the three cuts, reduction cuts, removal or thinning cuts, and heading cuts. And remember, reduction cut is used to slow the growth 
of a branch. Removal, it's obvious, is gone. So it's used for opening up a canopy and heading cuts is to encourage bushier growth. In trees, except for probably very young trees, um, I don't think we have the occasion to use heading cuts much. And um, I think removal cut is probably the second most often used and reduction is the most often used. And finally, the areas of focus for pruning, pay attention to branch placement, angle and aspect ratio, aim to support the central leader, allow it to grow well and gain girth, keep the lower branches for as long as you can to gain taper and don't forget to correct roots. So with all of this information, if you feel overwhelmed or really ready to go out and put what um, you picked up today to practice, I would suggest go into the garden, pick a tree, and maybe take some photos, project it on your computer screen, and use it to help plan the potential cuts. And I would recommend make your pruning decisions based on health and strong structure. Now, a few other things to keep in mind, limit the total removal of foliage to less than one third. And um, I'm seeing more recommendations um, in the one fourth range. So be somewhat conservative. Don't go too, uh, don't get too happy with your pruner. Uh, but always remove the dead disease and damaged stuff first because they're not doing your tree any good. So take them off as soon as you can. And then work on the dysfunctional portion. And in structural pruning, the dysfunctional portion are those upright branches on the side competing with your central leader. Begin working in the top portion of the tree because that's where the most activity and growth is happening. And whatever you do there will be paying dividends greater than elsewhere. When you are pruning, pause and step back, walk around the tree to observe periodically. And then when you're done, stand under the tree on a sunny day and look for dapple sunlight. And that is indication of a job well done. So these are some of the resources that I use for the presentation. And um, if you have questions, which we will have a limited amount of time to address today, you're welcome to send a complete description of the question, state clearly what is the problem and what do you want fixed, and send the photos to the 10 Minute University Gmail address, and we'll be happy to um, get back to you. Hi, Cheryl, do we have any questions? Hi, Cheryl, yes, we do. And this is such a perfectly timed uh, workshop uh, to have, or webinar to have, because I'm ready to go out and start looking at some of the things in my yard that might need some adjustment. So yes, we do have a few questions. Eve wants to know, um, she had her uh, Kusa dogwood pruned by a pruning company in the winter, and she has all these water sprouts now. What should she do about it? And when should she do it? Hmm. So water sprouts are usually the response to pruning and often response to pruning in the winter. If the pruning is done in the summer, it will reduce the water sprouts response. But we also talked about pruning the winter when the plant is dormant, it's less traumatic on the plant. So um, going back to the water sprouts, the best thing she can do is monitor after the tree was pruned for the growth response and remove them as quickly as she can. And the least damaging way to get rid of the water sprout is just rub them off with your finger as you see them just appearing. So if you hire a company to prune your tree, just go back and watch it uh, when growth begins and use a pole or if you can reach it with your finger, just gently brush against to prune the surface. And that's the quickest and simplest way to get rid of water sprouts. Good answer. <clears throat> okay, Bill has a five, this is the common thing, you buy a new house and you inherit uh, plants that may have not been pruned the way you envisioned them. He has a five-year-old small leaf maple and has been pruned into a sphere. 
and he's wondering if it's <laughs> he's wondering if it's able if he's able to restore its its natural shape. Uh, I think it's it's quite possible, Bill. It probably will take you three to five years. Basically, what you're doing is taking the sphere, let it grow out, and at the same time rebuild the structure. So take a close look at it now because you can see all the stems and uh, shoots and figure out which stems do you want to keep in order to reshape the tree. And when it's dormant, you can reduce or cut off a number of the stems to simplify the structure so it's no longer a sphere and let it grow one or two or three seasons. And every year, look at the new growth and think about how you would like to reshape the tree. So picture the ideal shape in your mind, gradually remove the parts that don't belong in that ideal image and allow new growth and continue to reshape it. And eventually you should be able to reform the tree. Very encouraging for him. I'm sure, I'm sure he loves the tree, but <laughs> doesn't like the shape. Okay, Celine has a Nissa tree or a black gum tree that is about six feet tall and the trunk is only just about one inch in diameter. And she's wondering how she can prune off the lower branches so that they'll be at a height that she wants when the tree is mature, but she's afraid she's taking off too many branches. And is it too soon to do that? Uh, I'm glad Celine is asking now her, when her tree is only six feet tall keep those low branches. They're important for the taper and you only want to remove them when your tree is uh, toward, you know, middle age. So between middle age and maturity for the life of your tree, that's when you remove the lower branches. Otherwise, keep them there, develop the taper. That's good for the structure of the tree and the overall health. Great. Good answer. And here is a common question, uh, either from the ice storm in 2021 or the ice event we've had recently. Um, Yvette wants to know, how do I prune a 20 year old dogwood tree that lost its central leader in 2021's ice storm? The tree's recovering, um, but needs restructuring. And she just, she, how do you, she's learning, how do I, do I need to worry about a central leader? How do I restructure this dogwood when it doesn't have a central leader anymore? Well, if um, I think there are two options. Um, number one, sometimes it's possible for you to redevelop a central leader and that a candidate for the new central leader could be ones that already have more of an upright tendency and it's more located in a position that's kind of toward the center of the tree. So if there is a candidate pot, uh, that's emerging, nurture that central leader by suppressing the other branches that are close to it. The alternative is to develop into a multi-trunk tree. And then with each trunk, you can treat it as if it's an individual tree and allow it to have a central leader and subordinating the side branches. So each trunk will be healthy and have its strong structure. But um, it's also possible for her to send a photo to the Tammany University email account, and I'm happy to look at a photo, and perhaps that will be clearer in terms of options. Okay, thanks for a good answer. A um, couple questions on this topic. Best time to prune vine maples or dwarf maples? Should Are they both winter pruned, spring pruned, after? I think the best time to prune the smaller maples is when growth is about to begin because you can still see the form. And uh, vine maples really don't need a whole lot of pruning if they already have a structure that's developed. But the other smaller maples, uh, whether they're upright or whatever the form, the best time is when they're beginning to grow. and. One general rule is when you have um, areas in the maple where the leaves are very densely uh, distributed, you want to look for overlapping foliage. And when branches are 
still uh, young, sometimes it's possible instead of a cutting, you can just snap them off with your fingers and you want to minimize the overlapping. So when you're done with pruning your small maple, you would have, as you look from the outside, basically one layer of foliage. I don't know if that's making sense. Um, it's making sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's a good goal to aim for. And that will give you a wonderful see-through canopy without having um, too much. And the beauty of having one layer of foliage is you minimize the dead spot in the center because the leaves and branches in the area that does not get light will die over time. So this way you're preserving the health in addition to the beauty. Great answer. Um, here's a conifer question. Um, this person has an old cedar that's quite tall and doesn't have any lower branches, especially on one side because it had been crowded with other evergreens that had to be removed. Um, it has healthy growth all around the, near the top, but and it's been fine during the last windstorm. But the concern is, do I need to worry about all that growth at the top causing it to be vulnerable in a windstorm or an ice event? I would say no. If your tree is looking healthy, there is a lot of growth on the top. Um, obviously, there is there's no option for us to you know regrow lower shoots in order to keep the tree in better balance. As long as the roots are strong and the tree remains healthy, um, it should be fine. Excellent. We and we've had, and I that's been my observation too. Is they, if they're really healthy and and look happy, they're probably not going to be too vulnerable. Um, a couple of people have have been concerned about missing this. They didn't the section on bleeders uh, in trees like smoke bush. Could you? They're wondering if you could please repeat that information, just because they it went, seemed to go fast and they were very interested in that. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Some of the trees when they're beginning to grow they bleed, which is actually the, um, basically the water inside the tree moving as the tree is growing. And when you make a cut, it likes to ooze out. And maple actually is a good example, uh, along with smoke shrub and a number of other examples that I put on the screen. So the thing is uh, to watch out for is number one, Compare the list when you watch the presentation again against your tree and see if, in fact, you have a potential bleeder. And if you don't, don't worry about it. Um, if you do, then you want to wait until it actually grows a little bit out and prune either a little later or a little earlier. Because if you leave a fresh cut when it's just beginning to grow and most inclined to bleed, it's unsightly. The research I've read, basically researchers disagree. Some people say, oh, it's really bad for the tree to lose all that liquid. Um, but some others say, oh, it's just unsightly, a bother, but it does not have substantial uh, problem for the tree's health. So I would say, don't worry too much about it because there are so many other considerations in when it's the best time to prune, including your own schedule and all of the weather <laughs> issues. Uh, so when you're ready to prune, go ahead and prune. And if you notice bleeding, you know, just stop and uh, come back later to do the pruning after the tree has, has some chance to grow a little bit more. Excellent advice. And that's our last question. This has yeah. been a wonderful webinar with uh, lots of wonderful information that I'm hoping that I retain so when I get out there to prune, I know what to do. Well, thank you everybody, everybody for joining us. You will receive the recording link uh, probably tomorrow and all of the resources mentioned in this presentation will be included in that email as well. And again, if you don't see it, check your spam folder. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Cheryl and Carol and Patty for helping out today. Thanks everybody, bye.